Hello, I'm Chris Richardson, and I'm an electronics engineer focused on power supplies. This is the first of a series of videos for viewers who aren't necessarily electronics engineers, but want to learn more about, test, and use power supplies. If you're a student, a hobbyist, or someone who needs to modify a power supply for pretty much any reason, electronicstutorials.ws and I hope that these videos will get you started. One important goal of this first video is to show you some basic items that will help to test a power supply, but to do so without spending thousands of dollars or euros or the equivalent wherever you're watching this from. I've put together a list with some of the approximate costs here in Spain, where I live and work. Here I've gathered some of the basic supplies needed to work with and to test power supplies. So, wire strippers, some clippers, some thin tweezers for grabbing small components, here are two silver box power supplies that I salvaged from an old PC, from two different old PCs. This one is a very old one. It actually has a 20 pin connector. And here we can see after modification. And I'll get into some of the details of this one later. So if you focus in closely, this one's upside down, so maybe turn it around. So if you focus in here, a silver box power supply, will, power supply will tell you how much power it can provide overall and also how much of the different voltages it gives. Also salvaged from some old PCs were two DC fans. These run off of 12 volts. Most of them come with a very convenient connector also. Seems like something basic, but for the basic plugs, here's that you can turn on and turn off with a switch. Very nice. A soldering iron. One that has a fairly thin tip right, that allows us to solder some small components. Some fairly thin solder and of course safety goggles. As far as electrical tools go, I like to have two multimeters. They come with these kind of tips here. Two multimeters are good for measuring two voltages, but also for measuring either a, cur a current and a voltage. And at least one wire that has a banana plug on one end and an alligator or so-called grabber clip on the other end. The last tool here looks a lot like a multimeter, but this is actually a thermocouple. I'm going to turn it on. And what it does is actually measure temperature. It measures the temperature out of the tip here. I'm using a plastic workbench here. So this is the kind of thing that you could find anywhere. Nothing special. In planning for this series of videos, I debated very seriously the topic of using or not using an oscilloscope. Do a quick search and you'll find plenty of devices like the one on the screen that attach to your PC and make it into an oscilloscope. In the end, I decided this was better than nothing because actually seeing some power supply voltage waveforms really helps to understand them. But be aware that 20 MHz, even though it sounds high, isn't enough to see many of the so-called transient effects in power supplies. That means things that happen very quickly. So during these videos, we'll stick to things that happen mostly in steady state. All right, here we have an oscilloscope that is not the 60 euro model that I talked about. It's a slightly fancier one. But uh, what I'm going to do to make my waveforms that I show in all these presentations more realistic or closer to what you would see with the cheaper model that you can get off of the internet is to do two things. One, these aren't the probes that came with my uh, fancier oscilloscope. These are some lower quality probes. And the lower quality probe has lower output resistance or impedance and has higher output capacitance. Those are things that distort the waveforms. The other thing I'm going to do is focus in here and you can see the BW that's written there, that stands for bandwidth. That means that this oscilloscope is bandwidth limited 20 megahertz. Right? That's the same limit that the cheaper oscilloscope has. So that will make the measurements that I show closer to what you'll see if you have the less expensive device. Just about everyone has an old PC gathering dust in their basement or their attic. The floppy disk drive may be useless, but that power supply, the so-called silver box, may still be good. As the web-based tutorial on electronics tutorials shows, an ATX power supply provides a whole host of different voltages and quite a bit of power. Also, take a moment and remove any fans you find in the case of your old PC. Those will be great later for blowing air and keeping your power supplies and other electronics cool. Here's the pin of an ATX power supply. This actually has the 20 pins of the older ones and then the four extra pins that you can attach. And it's coming off of a power supply that my brother-in-law was kind enough to donate to the cause. 
Of course, there are lots of extra wires connected. One important thing to keep in mind is that they're color-coded. Every single wire that's yellow delivers positive 12 volts. Every wire that is black is ground or the reference. Every red wire is 5 volts. And my suggestion is to follow what the tutorial says because the main connector also has some negative voltages, so this is the one that will actually cut off. Here's the other silver box power supply after I cut off the main connector and convert it into this breakout PCB. So, you can see here I've got these spring-loaded clamps that allow me to connect different wires in there. I've soldered a lot of the wires in parallel here to give me more power. Now this particular ATX power supply doesn't have a switch on the back, so when I want to turn it on, I'm going to use one of my little independent switches here. When I do, we don't hear anything, right? The fan is not running, and that's because it actually has an on-off switch. That's the green wire here, so I'm going to come over here, switch it on, and now it makes lots of noise. Definitely running. And I've switched out the negative lead here so that I can test the different voltages. My multimeter. So let's see what we've got. Negative 12 volts. Alright. Standby power. This is always on even if I flip off the switch. Minus 5 volts. The power grid signal is a logic level signal that actually tells us whether or not the power supply is operating. Also notice the positive 5 volts, the positive 12 volts, and the positive 3.3 don't have a particularly great tolerance and that's because there's not much load. Meaning to say that when these are not, aren't delivering much current, and in this case they're delivering really almost no current, they're not particularly precise. That will improve once they start to deliver some power. I used so-called perf board to make the backside of my connector for the ATX power supply here. It lets me put lots of wires in parallel. In this case, I used a kind that has a 2.54 millimeter or 100 mil pitch, and the rows are all connected together in parallel. Here's another kind of perf board, which is good for other types of experiments, also with a pitch of 2.54 millimeters or 100 mil, but with each little square separated from its neighbors. Earth in this context refer to the potential of so-called safety earth, or protective earth. That's the third connection in your wall power outlet. In the European Union, there are little tabs in each electrical socket. It's the only connection that your finger can touch easily because it's perfectly safe to do so. In fact, if your workspace is a plastic or wooden table, like the one that I'll be using, then you want to earth yourself by touching an earth connector regularly, especially before handling any semiconductor microchip, or anything else that's sensitive to ESD. That's electrostatic discharge. Since I'm using a plastic workbench here, it could build up electrostatic discharge, or ESD. So, what I want to do is to earth myself fairly regularly, especially before I touch any semiconductor chips. So I'm using the continuity tester, the beeping function of my multimeter here, and I'm connected to the earthing clip here. We can touch with our finger. Now, the actual power supply is connected through the cable. In theory, it's a device where the case should be connected to earth. So, I take the other end of my multimeter and test. Now, if I press hard to go through the coating, I can see that it does. What I want to do really is touch the screws that are connected to the frame. So, when I go ahead and do any actual testing, regularly I'll just reach a finger over here and actually touch. Right. So, that discharges any ESD that's built up on my body before I transfer it to anything sensitive like a semiconductor chip. As the next video segment shows, a charge capacitor with nothing to drain the voltage off of it can stay charged for a long time. A typical practical joke among electronics and electrical engineers is to charge up a capacitor and then hand it to someone who isn't expecting it. I do not recommend that you try that at home. And the charge capacitor phenomenon is why a lot of electronics still recommend that when you need to reset them, you turn them off, wait a while, and then turn them on again. That's to allow all the internal capacitors to discharge to zero to make sure that everything digital inside the device is actually turned off. To demonstrate how a capacitor that's not loaded or not connected to anything can hold charge for a long time, I'm going to use a laptop here and its charger. 
This laptop's battery is almost dead, so it wants a lot of power. And when I turn on the charger, they included a little white LED here that turns on to let us know that it's charging. The laptop itself is drawing a lot of current, so as soon as I turn this off, the LED begins to fade. Yep. And as soon as the LED has faded all the way, we know that the output capacitor and there's a lot of output capacitance in a power supply like this laptop adapter. It's completely drained. Now, if I disconnect it and perform the same test, the LED turns on. When I disconnect it, nothing seems to happen. That's because the LED is barely drawing any current at all. There's a huge amount of capacitance. Millifarads, that's to say thousands of microfarads of output capacitance here. And it's going to take probably a minute or so for this uh, output capacitance to completely discharge. Well, we can see the LED is getting dimmer here. But uh, the moral of the story is whenever a capacitor is charged up and there's no load on it, it may still be charged minutes later. So you need to be careful, especially if it's charged up to a voltage higher than, say, 30 to 40 volts. That's enough to give you a nasty shock. That concludes part one of power supplies for non-electrical engineers, and hopefully you are now set up to begin testing an actual power supply. Stay tuned for part two, where we'll look at unregulated or semi-regulated power supplies. Just to be clear, the ATX that we've converted is a regulated power supply. On behalf of myself and Electronics Tutorials, thanks, and see you next time.